negotiation is a well-structured, disciplined approach to creating value. Love it. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Wellness Dojo podcast, where we bring real solutions to real health and wellness problems. On today's episode, we have Mark Raffin, the Negotiations Ninja, a negotiations expert and coach who helps others extract value from everyday events and big ticket opportunities. Without further ado, let's get started. We're here. Welcome back to the Wellness Dojo podcast. I'm here with my host, Dr. Riley Anderson, and we're excited to have Mark Raffin with us. The negotiations ninja we thought it was Ooh, fitting to bring you. in the negotiations ninja with the naturopathic ninja and yes. the strength sifu here so yeah there's a lot of a lot of stealth and opportunistic attacking yes. that's going to be happening a lot of hiding today. in the darkness for some reason <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah so mark welcome to the show thanks for coming this thank is thank you for uh, having me it's yeah, great to be here yeah it's uh, it's great to have you and i'm excited to dive into kind of a little bit of what you do um can you for the people who maybe don't know you uh, on this show, kind of explain who you are, what you do, and how you got to do what you're doing. So my name is Mark. I'm the founder of Negotiations Ninja. It's a negotiation coaching and training business. We teach people how to have difficult conversations, whether it's negotiation, conflict resolution. Um, maybe it's something that is a little bit easier than that even. But for whatever reason, you find it challenging to have that conversation. We teach people how to use influence and persuasion and those types of tools to really get more value out of their lives. Whether you're in business or even in your personal life, negotiation is something that we all do on a daily basis, whether we like it or not. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have the tools to be able to do it properly, it becomes very challenging to get value out of those conversations that you're afraid of having. So that's what we do in a nutshell. I got into it because my entire career has been about negotiation, sales, and influence. And so I decided to leave the corporate world about five plus years ago and start this training and coaching business. And the reason I did it is primarily because I noticed a dramatic lack of adequate training and information out there helping people. There's a lot of information. Key word I said was adequate mm -hmm. because... Anyone can say anything on the internet, but getting good information is really, really important. So that's why I started Negotiations Ninja, and it's applicable to everyone's lives. I mean, that's why we're here today, right? That's We're here to talk about health, and we're here to talk about how to apply negotiation, maybe persuasion, influence techniques to get more value out of your daily life. It's a big deal. Yeah. Were you in sales before? Like, was your Started my career in sales. Uh, right out of university in ad sales, um, did very well, ended up paying off all my student loans in a couple of years and was very, very happy with that. But then for whatever reason, maybe I'm masochistic, I went to the other side of the table and I bought things for a living. Um, and so I was the opposite end of that conversation. So I've been able to see both sides of mm -hmm. that coin, which is nice. You were you worked in the corporate world for a while too, didn't you? Did a little little bit of that. Yeah. Yeah. Did Nothing you, too serious. Did you notice that as well? That like in that corporate world, there's a lot of did you notice a lot of pressure to for influence and sales and that type of thing as well? Well, certainly you notice that um, there are micro negotiations happening all the time. Of course, when people tend to think of it, I think we think money and things like that. But goodness, uh, for time and energy, especially, uh, I found in the corporate world, people are always trying to negotiate for for your time and, and to meet with, with you and this and that. And then not to mention all the people coming off LinkedIn to pick your brain constantly. I'm sure you get that. Just yeah, I just say no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. Unfortunately, yeah. you can book you can book some time on my website. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yep. And so I, I thought it was interesting what you said about uh, we do it all the time, whether we like to or not, whether That's we're right. even aware of it or not, probably. And even just, you know, leading up to, to this, I was thinking about all the negotiating I even do with myself mm -hmm. sometimes to try to get me motivated to do various things. A lot things of people and, do that. Yeah, and which uh, maybe it's something I want to uh, touch on as well, because when it comes to health and wellness and developing um, not just motivation, but even systems in place that you want to adhere to so you can reach a common goal, that's kind of like you're negotiating with yourself that if I, if I engage in this action, this behavior, then maybe this section B can happen, whatever the reward is. Now, yeah. does negotiation, does it always... <laughs> Is there always that element where there is kind of like this reward um, to no. it? For, no. No. <laughs> sometimes negotiations just don't work, right? Like sometimes, 
And that's, unfortunately, I think that the definition of negotiation is a little bit misleading. Especially, I think the dictionary defines it where two or more parties come together to try and get to a mutually beneficial outcome. But it may not be mutually beneficial, mm -hmm. and there may not be an outcome. And so that doesn't mean you haven't negotiated. But, and I think that's the part that a lot of people struggle with, is that if I negotiate then I should be getting some sort of successful outcome out of this. Not it's always. Like a win or a lose kind of situation. Not, not, yeah, not even necessarily a win or a lose, but something that's beneficial to me or we resolve the conflict or we can now move on in a situation. But sometimes it doesn't work. That's not to say that you shouldn't do it because you're significantly more likely to make it happen if you do it. Uh, but it, it doesn't mean you haven't negotiated. And the better and better you get, like any skill, yeah. right? Like you teach things like this for a living, mm -hmm. right? Like how to do a proper squat technique or something like that. Once you learn how to do that well and you practice it over and over and over again, the benefits to your life are so substantial. Mm -hmm. It's it's fantastic. So the more and more that you practice it, the better you're going to get. There is no, it's very similar to martial arts because there is no end perfection state. Yeah. It's, it's a practice. And you have to practice your practice, mm -hmm. uh, and the better you get, the the better results you're going to get. Yeah, it's a difficult it's a difficult thing for people who aren't. I don't even know if I would even say naturally gifted because, like mm -hmm. you said, like like everything, anybody can get good at it. You, it's just a matter of like how much time are you willing to commit to it. But people who, for example, are put into a sales role who maybe aren't strong at sales, it can yeah. be very discouraging for them. And and I, I see that resonate well into health and wellness also yeah. for people who maybe you know struggle with working out or something like as they're trying to do it they're trying to get those reps in there's this period of like it's so discouraging for them yeah the first part sucks yeah so what, what do you say to people like that who are who really struggle with that negotiation or that sales aspect of something for them to get better is there are there like words of encouragement yeah or... do you want to make more money yeah <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's pretty straightforward, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, if you want to get good at negotiation, all you have to do is look at the results of great negotiation. It's the single skill that could elevate your income substantially very, very quickly mm -hmm. with just the change of a few ways of how you do things and how you plan and prepare. And it's not a significant amount of effort that has to be put in, but technique is more important, at the, especially at the beginning, Technique is more important than reps mm. to maybe use a, like a workout terminology, yeah. like practice your technique as good as you can, as yeah. well as you can um, in as many situations as you can, but don't sacrifice technique for reps Just or for weight. Yeah. Yeah, it's like you practice a bad squat enough, it becomes muscle memory. If you practice right. a bad habit enough, it becomes a bad habit that's part of your routine now. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, no, exactly correct. And I think for whenever you're learning any kind of skill, whether it's weights or golf or um, chess, like it doesn't really matter what you're trying to learn. The first part of learning that new skill is always the hardest part. Mm. When you get comfortable with it is when you start moving into mastery. And that's when things become a lot easier for you. But the first part of learning any skill is, is the hardest. The, the benefit of negotiations is even in that first part, you could be very, very successful and make a lot of money very, very quickly or save a lot of money or resolve a lot of conflict and save a relationship. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's the single most, in my opinion, and I'm biased because this is what I do. It's the single most important interpersonal skill I think you can develop. Because if you can do this well, even if conflict arises, you can deal with that conflict. Yeah. And that's really important for a lot of people who maybe struggle with conflict avoidance. It's something I saw on your website was you talked about like kind of why you got into this negotiation world and becoming a, an expert in that field. And a, a big thing that resonated with me was you mentioned, you know, negotiation, you believe can change people's lives. Big time. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, whether, you know, if if you think of it this way, and, and I'm sure all of the, the viewers and the listeners have had relationships go really badly in their lives, whether it's a, a partnership that you have with someone 
or whether it's a, a sibling or a cousin or even a good friend or a workplace relationship, for some reason, in a couple of weeks, a relationship can go from really, really great to really terrible. Now, there are probably markers that you may not have noticed along the way that had you noticed those markers, you may have been able to salvage it earlier. But even if it gets really, really bad, there's very rarely a relationship that goes poorly that you cannot bring back. And that's why I believe it can change people's lives because I've seen it happen. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm very fortunate in that I get to train, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people on an annual basis how to get more value out of their lives and how to get more value out of their businesses. And the change that it not only makes in their income and their relationships, but their mindset is is very, very interesting. Yeah. I would imagine you probably do in that coaching experience. It's, well, a lot of people are maybe entering it from a financial standpoint that you probably do get a lot of that crossover like we yes. see with, with, you know, nutrition or fitness Big or time. whatever the case might be. You see that, that crossover of, uh, you know, the confidence in trying to, feel more valued that I can yes. get more money from this, you know, salary negotiation translates into the value that I feel in these relationships in my life and oh, yeah. how much time I put in. You could exercise. go so far as to say it's almost like a form of self respect and self love, even totally. to stand up for yourself like that and negotiate. Yeah. And, and, and just, and just be clear about what you need or want out of the relationship or out of the deal that you're trying to negotiate. There's a lot of the unfortunate thing about my world, and I'm sure your world as well, is there's a lot of really bad information out there. Yeah. And, and one of the things that I keep seeing pop up all the time, and this may sound super controversial, is like, you're worth it. So make sure that you negotiate your worth. Well, maybe you're not worth it right now. Yeah. Maybe you need to work on yourself a little bit more to be worth what you think you're worth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And... And that's okay. That's mm -hmm. okay. It's okay to recognize that you may need to work on a couple of things before you think you're owed that amount of money. I see this all the time in, in salary negotiations. We don't coach people on salary negotiations, but oftentimes I help people out who, who are friends or close relatives where they say, well, I'm worth this amount of money. And then we benchmark them against where the market actually is. And we say, unfortunately, you're not worth that amount of money. Now, Here's how you can become worth that amount of money. Yeah. Fantastic. But for you to blindly say I'm worth it without doing the work to be able to establish whether you are is is very dangerous. It's very dangerous to put yourself into that kind of because you will never come to an outcome in a negotiation that makes sense for you because you haven't put in the work to research where you actually should be. Yeah. I think that's an important topic to discuss because I, th I hear a lot of people in my coaching that feel undervalued in their in their work. Like I'm putting in this much yeah. time, I'm putting in this much effort, and I don't feel like I'm you know getting that value back from the company. Right. So then when but but then when they go into maybe a salary negotiation or looking for a new job or something like that, they're scared to ask for more, mm. right? And it's but what you said is very interesting as well. Of like, how does somebody actually know? Is it just based on the work that they put in that kind of gives them that confidence to? It's a, it's a combination of both things. So I, you, you do need to be worth it, right? Like you have to have put in the work. You do have to have the experience. You have to have shown that you've given success in your role. You've provided value to the organization. And that could be in your business as well. If you don't have the sales that show that your business has done well, people aren't going to buy your business for as much as you think it's worth, right? Mm -hmm. It's just sort of simple math. And also, you you also have to tell people about it, right? Yeah. So you, there's a very common misconception that exists in the world today that, look, especially in North America, if I just do the work, I will be recognized and people will see me for the work that I have done. Not always. No. You also have to show and influence people to tell them what you have done so that they know because they may not necessarily be paying attention. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. And so if you are not telling people, it doesn't have to be in a sort of braggadocious way. You don't have to be arrogant about it, but you do have to illustrate how you've provided value. And if you haven't done that, people just aren't going to know. And so if people don't know, they're not going to be able to make a decision. Yeah. So it sounds like um, before the <clears throat> negotiation really starts, it's about effective communication and communicating your position, communicating those wins. Like you said that they've had previously the value that they provide. It's like first, you just have to be an effective communicator. So it sounds like that's part of the coaching that, that you do. Yeah, you do have to be an effective communicator. And a part of that is not just um, saying what you've done and communicating what you've done, but also listening to what's important. Mm -hmm. Active what, listening. Active listening to what is important to the business. Because maybe what you're doing, even though you think it's really great work and you're putting in a ton of effort and a ton of time into it, maybe it's not all that important because mm -hmm. that's not what's being measured. And so what are the measurements for success within your organization, within your role? If you are not doing those things that contribute towards the measurement of that success, even though you're putting in a ton of time and a ton of effort, no one may care. Yeah, if your values don't align with the company's values, then Big you're, you're going to constantly feel misaligned the same way that it would in a relationship like a marriage. If yes. your values here don't align with the values with this person, yep. you're going to constantly be uh, finding misalignment in what you're receiving from that person as well, right? Yeah, very much so. And, I, and unfortunately, I think for a lot of people, and this is a very difficult conversation to have, is the data shows that people get more of a salary bump leaving their organization to go somewhere else mm -hmm. than they do by getting their annual raise or having that discussion. Um, that's not to say that you shouldn't have that because maybe you want to stay at that organization and maybe you're willing to sacrifice that bump to stay at your organization because you really love it there and you love the culture and you love the people and you love the work. But the data does show that you get more of a salary bump by moving somewhere else. Yeah. It's very interesting. Yeah, or threatening to move somewhere else because then the company might give you a salary bump too, right? Yeah, and that rarely works out. Oh, okay. Um, it works out short term. Oh, I see. Short term, it uh, works out great. But if if you've made that play to yes. to say, hey, I've got offers elsewhere. If you don't give me this thing, I'm going to go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Most likely what will end up happening is you'll probably still end up going to that place because you probably want to go in the first place you've, anyway. You've or, or they'll mentally, see you differently too. Yeah. yeah. And you've mentally committed to that change, right? Yes, like absolutely. You, you, now, you should have that backup. Don't yeah. get me wrong. Yeah. Having those offers is the best part of that strategy, right? Because now you've got options. Before, you didn't have options. One of the biggest parts of strength in negotiation is having the ability to say, I don't think so, right? I think I'm just going to go somewhere else. That's a great source of strength. But you also, if that happens, have to make that decision. Yeah. So there's a big difference between having an option and enacting that option. Yeah. It's a big cognitive change that a lot of people need to jump across sort of the bridge of because even if you don't decide to go and you decide to stay with the organization because they gave you more money, where are you really? Yeah. In your head yeah that's that's what i was just gonna actually say is yeah, time and time again i've seen this with people where they feel undervalued and then we relate that automatically to our salary or whatever the case might be but then it was actually the the work-life balance that that yes. actually made the biggest difference when they shifted companies or like financially maybe they were exactly where they were but they're so much happier now yeah so they have a much more positive outlook on on that salary that they they have even though it's the same salary they feel better about it because they're they're feeling more respected or, or they're respecting themselves better in that environment whatever the case might be when most people go into negotiations they think that negotiation is often about one thing but really it's about more than that mm -hmm. so they they'll say things like i want to make more money or i want more freedom, whatever those things mean. Those are great aspirational goals, but they actually don't mean anything unless you have some success drivers that you can put in place that help you to achieve those goals. So for example, let's just say 
you know, I want to make more money. Well, how much more money do you want to make? Let's first define that. And then what are the things that will help you get to that number? Is it a bonus structure? Is it more salary? Is it um, your ability to get commission on referrals or sales? Is it, it could be a number of different things that help to get to that number. But so often people are binary in their thinking and they say, well, if I don't get this number, then I'll walk. Well, there is a way, there's a different way. We could think of this in a bunch of different ways. Mm -hmm. And people become very myopic in their approach as a result. And they put the blinders on and they only think about one thing. And then for whatever reason, the, the negotiation doesn't work out because there isn't anything really to trade at that point. It's either this or nothing. And that's a very dangerous position to put yourself within because you've narrowed your acceptable outcome to something so small that a, a deal happening becomes very improbable. Whereas if you had more things that you could negotiate within that, it becomes easier to get to the outcome that you want. Yeah, that's uh, that all or nothing type thinking is a thinking trap that's outlined in psychology as um, almost like a form of self-sabotage. Big time, yeah, so. because you, you've, you've put yourself, you painted yourself into a corner. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you can't expect the counterparty, the person that you're negotiating with or the organization that you're negotiating with, to think differently if you've defined the rules that way. If you're going in defining exactly what you want and that's only one thing, I mean, unless that's, that is the only thing that you actually want, which very rarely is the case, then you can't blame them for saying no to that. You haven't given them very many options. Mm -hmm. So think of adding additional, and this is very true for all negotiations. I like to break aspirational goals down into success drivers. Think of them as the things that you need or want out of the negotiation. So it could be to, uh, if you're running a business, to increase your prices. It could be to cross-sell different services. It could be to reduce risk in your contracts. It, it could be a number of different things that you want to try and achieve in that negotiation. Right. But we, we, we narrow our field of vision so little mm -hmm. yeah. that it becomes challenging. It sounds a lot like the, like the way that this kind of transfers over to everything is a lot of finding that balance between what do I want from this relationship, transaction, whatever, yeah. versus what am I willing to do to get it or give up to get, to yes. get it? Yes. Oh, such an important question. Yeah. So many people don't think about what they're willing to sacrifice to get the thing that they want. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And negotiation is like that because mm -hmm. you, in negotiation, it's a, it's, you, you have to get you have to get things, yes, but you also most likely to get those things will need to concede something. Um, and those things are situational based mm -hmm. on whatever negotiation you're going into. But it is ve very similar to life in that way, right? Like I want to look better and feel better. Fantastic. What are the habits that you are going to drop, the bad habits that you are going to sacrifice right now, the relationships that you are going to cut off, the situation that you might be in that you want to get out of, what are you going to concede to get the thing that you want? Yeah. And in that circumstance, you're negotiating with yourself. Yeah. That's very important. Yeah. I yeah. want this promotion. Are you willing to travel? Are you willing to right. yeah. work weekends? Are you willing right. to do these things? Because mm -hmm. that's what this entails. Yeah. Right. I want to have a happy marriage. Well, are you willing to explore yourself and like make self-improvements are you willing to go to counseling go to counseling yeah, are you right. willing to have children are you willing to like all these different things and very much like what you said with you know exercise and stuff like that too like what are you willing to give what are you willing to give up in order right. to achieve that goal mm -hmm. yeah i've heard it um you know structured as like you you at least you get to choose your sacrifice but you have to make a sacrifice you don't you get do. you don't get to not make one but you kind of get to choose a little bit um, how your journey is going to go by, by choosing your sacrifice. Yeah, and that's the thing that I really struggle with with a lot of a lot of people come out of negotiations saying things like, well, it was a bad deal and I'm really unhappy with the other party. And, you know, this is in there. There's like a like cognitive dissonance that comes with getting a bad result of the negotiation. You chose to do that. Yeah. Right. Don't blame the other parties trying to get value too. Mm -hmm. Don't get upset at them 
for trying to get value. That's what they're here for. Your job is also to try and maximize value. If you are unhappy about what you have negotiated, it's not their fault. It's your fault. Mm -hmm. Because we have the choice. We have the agency of choice. Now, sometimes we have to make deals because we've been told to make that deal, right? Sometimes we're in situations where the boss comes in and says, Jenny, you're going to have to cut this deal. I know this sucks for your commission, but we really need this account because we cannot lose control of this geographic area. And this is a very important play for us. So that's just the way it's going to be. Sometimes that happens, yeah. but very rarely. Yeah. Very rarely. Like when you think of the total types, the, all the negotiations that you're going to do, that happens very rarely. I'm a huge believer in perspective shifting. Mm. Is that a big part of negotiations? Well, I imagine it would be of like trying to put yourself in their shoes and yes. try and look through their lens on like, okay, what do they want out of this? What's important to them, whether what they want or what they want from me? I know that's a big thing that I find in relationships in my marriage with my kids, like all these things. I try and really put myself in other people's shoes constantly to almost check myself in a way. Is that important as well in negotiation? Big time. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. If if you're not willing to try and understand what the other party may need or want out of this, even those things that they may not necessarily be verbalizing, right? Like they say they want this thing from you, but really what they want is power. Hmm. or really what they want is a great relationship, or really what they want is ease of doing business. You need to be listening for those things. Now, what a lot of people get themselves into trouble with, though, is because m many people, especially those of us that are more gregarious and outgoing, we tend to be people pleasers, and we, we're very good at understanding what the other party wants. And then, unfortunately, what we do is we are so eager to please that need or that mm -hmm. want in that other person that we sacrifice our own needs and wants in order to please them for their needs and wants. Interesting. And that's very dangerous. So it, it, it's, it's a lot of... First, I want you to be selfish. I want you to think about what you want to get out of this. Then I want you to think about what the other party get, wants to get out of this. And write it down, right? Just be clear about... This is what I want to get out of this. This is what I think the other party get, wants to get out of this based on the questions that I've asked them. Where, where do we make this work? What am I willing to sacrifice? What am I not willing to sacrifice? Like, where's my line in the sand? Where are my boundaries? Here? Where are my boundaries? Yep. Um, and and where, where am I going to decide? And that's a very hard question to answer is like, where am I going to decide to walk away from this? Yeah. Because you may get pushed to a point where you do have to make that decision. Not to say that you're always going to get there, but this is a very great example. I was having a conversation with someone the other day, and they said they were trying to sell this new product in their business. And they said, well, I want to sell it. I'll just use fake numbers. I want to sell it for 100 bucks. Uh, but this person has offered $90 for me. I think I'm going to take it. I was like, great. Would you take 85? And they said, yeah, probably. I said, would you take 80? They said, probably. I said, would you take 75? No, I probably wouldn't take 75. Okay, good. Now we've established the bottom end of that range of what you're willing to accept mm -hmm. before you decide that this isn't worth it. So you have to be very clear about where you may decide to walk away from that deal. And that can be very hard because it's, it, it, the big number is very attractive sometimes, right? It's, it's very yeah. nice. Mm -hmm. You may get a job offer that's really amazing, but they may need you to be 90 hours a week. And so you're like, wow, this is like 250 grand, 300 grand a year. Incredible. But I also will never see my family. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So where 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 is the line for you and is the flip side of that what would i be willing to pay for my product or is that a dangerous place for people to get as well no not necessarily i think you you are always going to be biased as to especially if it's your own business you're always going to be biased as to the quality of your product so i would do the research to be able to understand what people might pay yeah and then probably just add a little bit more to that 
um, because it's always easier to come down than it is to go up. Yeah. I, I just love all the millions of uh, micro versions of this happening on like Facebook marketplace and things yes. like that every day. Right. <laughs> yeah. and, and I, and I go through that and, and, and so does, uh, so does Ali. Cause like we're both kind of thrifty people at, at heart and we love getting deals and things like that. But we try to be very, very fair. Like I'm not a low ball or anything like that. If someone lists something for 120, I'll just say, Hey, how about a hundred? And normally there's no real negotiation, but when I list on there, and I list something like it's a nice vintage record player or something. I know they'll pay one fifty for it. The people coming in being like, "How about fifty dollars? How about sixty dollars?" Like, it's just crazy what what some people will. So I need to know for myself, yeah, even even with a small transaction is. like that, I need yeah. to know where my line is going in. I need to. I'm listing it at one fifty, but I kind of know. Okay, I let it go for a hundred. Truthfully, if it comes down right. to it or whatever, that's my bottom kind of thing. And right. Yeah, so it's just it's it's like so you can get practice just listing very quickly and very easily. I mean, on Facebook, you and know. it's uncomfortable, right? Like, yeah. it's, it's uncomfortable and it's it can be hard because a lot of the time when we when we negotiate, we are almost expecting the no, and so what ends up happening in negotiations is you think to yourself, well, this is why it's dangerous sometimes to think about what I would pay for my product. Yeah is you say, especially if you have, like you struggle with self-esteem and, and those kinds of things, you'd say, well, I think I'm going to sell this for 120. No one's going to pay 120. Yeah, I, yeah. I think I should, I, you know what? I think, let me, let me do something more reasonable and put it out there for 100. Well, what is that reasonable based on? Yeah. Is it based on data? which is what you should be doing, mm -hmm. right? Researching about what the market yeah. is currently selling at. Yeah. Or is it based on fear? Yeah. Because if it's based on fear, that's a bad decision. And a lot of people negotiate with themselves before they even go into their negotiation, especially business owners, where they start selling things and then they realize very quickly, no, no, it's, this is actually worth way more. And then they try to increase prices on their current customers and that's now you've just because you weren't able to set the right price early you're now putting yourself into conflict based situations later because you weren't able to do that yeah i, I think research is almost a form of communication in that way where that's like a form of like feedback that you're getting from yeah. something before you make that decision otherwise i know i fell into this when i was starting my business of like being uh, somebody who's just starting a business you're not in a place where you can spend a lot of money on a lot of things like for a long time, you're a struggling business owner. Yeah. And so you create this story in your mind about other people. Yeah. And like, well, if I can't afford this, how can I expect other people to? Like, there was times where I couldn't afford the services that I was offering. Yeah. Right? And so, like, you have to get yourself out of this place of, like, well, you know, I, like you said, like, being reasonable. Reasonable to who? And exactly. what's, what story are you making up about exactly. other people? And what's reasonable for them is yeah. maybe probably not reasonable for you, the business owner. Yeah. Or, and look, or that's, the person that's in the not to say that we don't all go through this. I mean, like yeah. you guys, as business owners, you know this when you when you probably first started out, you pr you underpriced your stuff way too low. Oh yeah, I know I did. Yeah, when I first started my business, I was selling courses for like five hundred bucks. Yeah, that's bananas. Yeah, there's no way I should have been doing that. And by the way, that was five hundred bucks to like ten people. Yeah, and now I'm selling courses of upwards of thirty grand. There's a big shift that had to happen in my confidence and the value that I provided and my mindset to be able to get there and the work that I had to put in to be able to charge those prices. Mm. But we all struggle with it. Yeah. So if, if you've got viewers and, and listeners right now that are listening to this thinking like, well, that's all good and well for you to say, Mark, like, for you to charge all those prices, you're the negotiation guy. Well, no, not really. Like we've all started yeah. at that point. You, you, you did the work, as you talked about before, you established your, your points of leverage so you could leverage that, exactly. that work and expertise and yeah. you know, everything you've put into it, which uh, that's like the little bit of negotiations I knew coming into this was if you're going to negotiate, you, you got to have points of, of leverage. Yeah. Um, you know, if you're going for a social media marketing job, you got, you know, and, and they, they say you're worth this and you go, I'm worth this. And they go, well, tell us why. And you go, because I have, you know, 100,000 followers on my YouTube account and right. I have this. And then they go, oh, 
I guess right. we didn't know that. And, you know, so yeah. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's really, I, I love what you said about like at the very beginning, it might be intimidating because you might fail and you can rely on technique um, but it still might might not go right. And right. when we're trying to get people to build habits and try uh, get new skills um, and life skills that increase quality of life, we've been calling that the Valley of Disappointment, which I think is a uh, it's in a habit building book um, by Atomic Habits or something like that. But it's that you got to get through yeah. the the those um, the, the trudges, yeah, part. yeah, at the beginning, and just know that it's going to be like that, and then eventually you're going to start to see that curve of improvement really take over. Um, especially when you start to get stronger in your, and I would assume that you see this with your clients, right? Like when they, you know, someone's been unhealthy and, and hasn't lifted anything or hasn't done any workouts for five years and they've been sitting on the couch, eating chips, drinking for five years. And then they start working out. They're like, I feel like a fat ass mm -hmm. in the gym, right? Like you're just like, ah. Yeah. This feels terrible, it right? Hurts. And, you, and it hurts. And you, <laughs> you feel like people are judging you, even though they aren't, right? That you feel like people are judging you. You look at yourself in the mirror. You're not happy about it. It takes a lot of hard work and discipline to get through that first little bit, like every skill. And I think that a lot of people aren't objective about it. They, they, they think like, this is unique to me. Mm -hmm. It's not. It's every yeah. literally everyone has to go through this you're not mm -hmm. special you're yeah you're not <laughs> and 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 this is the same as every habit that you try and build or every skill that you try to develop it's it's really hard in mm -hmm. the beginning but the more that you do it and the more that you practice it the better you're going to get yeah yeah there's a confidence that comes with the action as well um, yes can you speak to the confidence shift that you might have felt like the first time that you even asked somebody or presented a $30,000 or whatever package to somebody yeah. versus the 500, even if you get the no, does that change your confidence at all? Yeah. It, I mean, it's, it was very scary and I, I, I did it in stages. Mm -hmm. So, um, and by the way, a big part of the reason I did that was not because of me. It was because I hired a coach yeah. to help get me because I knew that I couldn't do it on my own and I needed yeah. someone to kick my ass. Absolutely. And, and help me go through that process. And so, you know, we started with 500. That was the first sale that I did in my business. Um, and it was to a friend of mine. And I think he was just being nice. Perfect. <laughs> and he really helped me, right? That was the just getting over that first hurdle. That was a big psychological boost for me. Mm -hmm. um, and then the next stage was like, well, if I could sell it for 500, I wonder if I could double it and sell it for 1,000. And I did. And then... Um, then at that point in time, I was like, I wonder if I could sell this for 5,000. And then I did. And then at that point I, I hit a ceiling of like, I don't think I could do more than this. And then I got introduced to a business coach that I still use to this day, wonderful guy. And he went through a lot of the stuff that I was coaching and training people on. And over a course of a few courses of conversations with, he's a very successful business coach. Um, a few courses of conversations with me, he's like, Mark, you are grossly underpriced, like grossly under. And I thought I was overpriced. Yep. I thought I was way overpriced. He said, if you teach sales teams how to do this, you should be charging way more money, way more money. And then I was like, I don't know, I still, you know, I would argue with him. Yeah. I would argue with him of like, I, I think you're wrong, right? Like, I don't think the market could support this. And he would be like, listen, having done this multiple times, you are, so I would argue. And then over a period of a couple of years, I went from five to 10 to 15 to 20 to 30. And it was, it was a progression of, understanding the value that I provided. Because once you start to hear the stories mm -hmm. about what value actually was provided, makes it way easier to say, this is easily worth 30. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like easily. In fact, I'm probably underpriced. Yeah. It takes one person that you just changed their life. Yes. To really help you realize like, okay, what I'm doing, like people would pay anything for this. That's right. 
Mm -hmm. right and the right person would pay anything for this and then it comes down to just finding the right person right that's right but i think that value translates again into relationships into your own personal health and stuff too because you have to really believe what you're worth yeah right if you're gonna if you're gonna commit to a new exercise plan to a diet whatever you have to actually first believe that like the sacrifice that i'm about to put into this i'm worth it I, I, I struggle with that idea. Do you mind if I play a little bit of, of devil's course. advocate? I love that. Because I think that at the beginning, I didn't know. Yeah. And I, there, I don't think there was a way for me to know until I started doing. And had, a, and had somebody that helped you break yes. that mindset. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. And, and even through that process of having that person, I argued with him weekly yeah. about you know what I should be doing and he's like you should do this and I'm like I don't think I should do that and he's like listen you've hired me for a reason yeah I'm telling you this is the way yeah and that what you just said right there is my pushback to you of like maybe you didn't feel like you were recognizing like you maybe didn't believe your value in that but you believed your value enough to hire a coach yes I there, there's the this whole idea of um, unconscious incompetence mm-hmm. um, conscious incompetence conscious in uh unconscious competence and i was in the conscious incompetence part yeah. right say like, that 10 times fast <laughs> i knew i knew that i didn't know yeah yeah and i was still struggling to get to the conscious competence yeah. portion of that yeah and i'm glad we got there because that's i think where a lot of people are it's like they know that they deserve to be healthier they know that they deserve to make more money. Maybe right. they know what they deserve, but they still are stuck in this place of it's still too hard to ask for it, or it's still too hard to yeah. to to just do it. Right? Yeah. Like it's such a tough thing for people. It, it is, and I think what's really important there is like if if you're not doing the things you need to do to improve your life so that you feel valuable enough mm-hmm. to ask. That makes it very challenging. It's it's really hard to explain to a person who, and I'm sure you see this. I'll try and liken it to like maybe a, a personal training thing. It see a person that sat on the couch for five years eating chips to say, um, you sh- you should be doing these things and you are worth it, because mm-hmm. that person probably doesn't feel like they're worth it. Yeah, that's why they've hired you. Yeah, because they need someone to tell them those things. Yeah, in much the same way that whenever you're starting out a new business or selling something that you think is of value to other people, you've been doing it a certain way for so long, or maybe not doing it at all. That person doesn't doesn't actually believe it. Yeah, and so it's a very hard, very hard mountain to climb psychologically because I think. It, it's not something that just turns on one day. Yeah. It's something that is built over time. And if, you, if you're listening to this right now, or you're watching this and you're thinking to yourself, I don't think I can get there. I promise you, you can. But you have to be willing to invest the time. Yeah. I think that's the, as, as long as you're, even if you are filled with doubt every day and you just go and do the work, like put in the work, put mm-hmm. in the effort, do the things that you're supposed to be doing, it will get better. Yeah. yeah. Even if it's doubtful every day. And it's anxiety relieving too, to know that at least you're trying to do the things that you've been putting off or that yeah. you should have been doing or that you've been fearful of doing. Um, at least I know that even in my own life, it's like my, my life gets so much better when I, I just structure myself a little bit more, have a little bit more discipline and just get to the chair as I call it just get to the seat just set your timer and just start working I don't care what you do yeah just make sure just, it's just towards work. your business to make sure just yeah just to get yeah. there kind of thing um, I want to make sure we touch on on one thing that uh, there's uh, some interesting parallels with what I do and that's um, actual uh, emotional regulation yeah and I, I know that you talked about this somewhere in, in the last half dozen episodes on your on your own podcast which is called Negotiations Ninja Podcast. Awesome. Yeah. So, um, yeah, somewhere I think in the last few episodes you were, you did touch on this, that emotional regulation is very important in very negotiations important. because, and I just wrote a, a blog on, uh, on, a, on emotional health. And uh, I was saying in there that, you know, you have to um, regulate both ends of it because 
let's say um, anger, of course, can result in destruction, but even exuberance can result in carelessness. Yes. So, th so that's very important when it comes to your overall health and living, you know, m more or less a consequence free type of life with being able to regulate your emotions. So with negotiations, it, when we're talking about money, especially man, do people get fired up? I get fired up when I'm, when, <laughs> when it's I hard, see a bill that I'm not, not expecting and it's like double what it should be. I'm like, ah, I just want to like, yeah, yeah. you know, fight. Hard not and, to. um, but you can't do that. So I, can we talk a little bit about regulating yeah, your emotions yeah. well, and I mean, negotiating? I'll give you a personal example. It, it literally just happened to me last week where one of my former clients offered me a job at their organization. I'm, I, I'm a business owner. I have a business that I want to grow. And that makes a certain amount of money. But the amount of money that this guy threw at me was so giant. <laughs> I had to really stop before I said yes. Like it was so much money that I, I started feeling like heart palpitations and like <laughs> stress. And like, I was, I was very much in like a, like an emotion filled state. And I was like, oh, I don't know what to do now. I, I, I have no idea what to do. And that was because I, he, he spoke to me a couple of weeks ago and he said, listen, what is it going to, what is it going to take for you to come on board? And I threw out a number that I honestly thought he wouldn't say yes to. And he said, yes, he sent, he sent me the email. Should have asked for more. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. And in that, in, in, in that moment, I was like, <sighs> <sighs> right and i was i was feeling all of the feelings mm -hmm. yeah. and then i got asked a really good question uh, by someone that i really care about and that person said to me how much is your freedom worth mm -hmm. and that's the reason i started my business is because of the freedom that i feel when i run it now to most people on the outside looking in if they had to look at my schedule they'll say you call this freedom but for me for me that's how it feels mm -hmm. Freedom has different yeah. definitions. Freedom has, freedom you're in the has driver's different seat. definitions. Yeah. 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 And so that person asked me, how, do, how much does your freedom cost? And I was like, that's a great question. <laughs> I had not considered that. And I, I sat down, I forced myself to sit, sit down and do the work and think about, okay, how much is my freedom really? Mm -hmm. And that freedom, which allows me, by the way, to whenever I want, spend time with my wife, spend time with my kids, go on a vacation, take a couple days off, do what I need to do around the house, right? That freedom, yeah. that's worth a lot of money to me. It is, yeah. To just be able to block off your schedule for a few hours and go to, go to the grocery store if you want and miss rush hour or something right. like that. Or like midday, it's... right? If I'm, I'm like, hey, I don't have any more appointments for the remainder of the day. I don't have any calls or, or Zoom meetings that I have to be on. Mm -hmm. It's two o'clock. I'm going to cut out. I'm going to go to the gym. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get a workout in. And then we're going to go to dinner. Yeah. Right? Like that, that freedom means a lot to me. And I realized in that moment that that wasn't the number. Yeah. And it was a good moment of reflection to realize that emotional regulation is a big part of what we do. And the easiest way to deal with that, whenever you feel yourself getting angry or frustrated or super exuberant or happy, you feel like you're losing control of your, you can feel the emotions mm -hmm. bubbling up, whatever emotion you're feeling is to slow down, yeah. mm -hmm. slow down. And it's very counterintuitive because we see a lot of movies and media where you've got these slick sales types on the phone banging out deals really really like, quickly yeah, like tom cruise or something. right like <laughs> boiler room wolf of wall street type yeah. conversations and that's just not what negotiation is yeah negotiation is a well-structured disciplined approach to creating value love it and that forces you if you think of negotiation that way forces you to slow down and that's important yeah I think that's one thing that's very misunderstood from people who aren't business owners is that there are certain things, certain reasons and values to why we do what we do, like freedom yeah. or just like helping other people even that to a lot of us is priceless. Yeah. 
Like there is no price that could pull me away from that. I don't know. There is probably a price. <laughs> I mean, if I had to I throw mean, a stupid amount of money at you, you'd be like, you'd, yeah, okay. You'd definitely consider it. But uh, it, uh, it again, it, it brings us back to what we talked about You have to about figure before. out where's your line. Where's your line yeah. and what, uh, you know, what am I willing to give up for yeah. that number too? Yeah. Right. Am I willing to give up that feeling of helping people, that feeling of fulfillment, that feeling of yeah. purpose that I have through what I'm doing yeah. to do this thing? And will this thing give it to me as well? Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. Can we talk a little bit about just um, kind of your offerings, what you do? I know you help teams, but you also help individuals. What kind of people are you helping and how can they get a hold yeah, of you? Yeah, most, mostly salespeople, uh, executives, uh, leaders in uh, medium to large organizations and helping them get more value out of their business lives primarily. Uh, I'm not a therapist. I'm not a counselor. So I, I won't and cannot consult you on, you know, how to resolve conflict in your personal life. I'll leave that to a therapist to be able to deal with. But if there's a workplace situation and you see, especially with like you know, the back to office stuff that we're experiencing a lot right now where executives are trying to get their teams back to work um, and they're trying to get their sales teams to perform better coming out of COVID. That, those are the kinds of things that I work with. So if you're in that kind of a space, you're, I'm probably the guy that you need to speak to. Um, and you can, it's as easy as going to LinkedIn and typing in my name or going to my website, which is negotiations.ninja and having well, a conversation yeah and we'll link those into our uh into our uh notes our show notes um yeah yeah this was awesome and i think there's more parallels with negotiating in health than maybe Absolutely. you realize you know with very much self-confidence so. emotional regulation negotiating with yourself to, yeah. <laughs> to try to you know implement your 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 new healthy habits and things like that so and it all yeah. takes practice like you said right it sure does i uh, really appreciate that you kind of use the, the term value. I know it's maybe a, a term that gets thrown around a lot, but separating money and value, I think mm. is, is something that I think a lot of people overlook. Yes. Maybe. Right. And it's like, you it's said, a part of it. Money's a part absolutely, of it. Absolutely. Sure. Absolutely. Um, does money equal happiness? I think it's a great accelerator of happiness. I think <laughs> it's a great accelerator. It's a catalyst of happiness. But it is not, I mean, if you look at, there are some people that are just absolutely miserable in their lives that make oodles of like more money than you could fathom. And there's a big difference between, I think, um, the happiness of like, which is just pure, pure joy and laughter and that kind of stuff and the meaning mm -hmm. that you get from your jobs I, I can't remember what the greeks called it but i think that meaning they called it like eudaimonic happiness or something to that effect where you you derive a certain amount of meaning you feel a purpose in what you're doing yeah that's a happiness that is really hard to equate to the other kind of happiness because you may not fe always feel joyful you may not always feel laughter and bubbly feelings and sunshine and rainbows and unicorns, but you may find meaning in what you do. Yeah. And that's way more powerful. And yeah. so um, is money uh, equate to happiness? No. Is it a catalyst for happiness? Absolutely. Hmm. Same question to you as we wrap Yeah, up. I think there's a point of diminishing returns of money and happiness. I think at a, at a certain point, you know, you want to make sure that you're taking care of yourself and your family and maybe there's, you know, there's room for for growth in various dimensions of your life. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I certainly uh, have experienced uh, how stressful it can be to not have enough enough money. Not having money <laughs> and, sucks, and it's dude. it's brutal. And so you know, I know that what that can do to your body and to your mental health as well. Yeah. So it is part of it. It, it. it is unless you've figured out how to have no overhead and no expenses, which maybe some people uh, out on Vancouver Island or something they figured out. <laughs> but. Um, you know, practically speaking, it is part of it. And, and that's why they call it financial health sometimes yeah. as well. Yeah, I would almost say money could maybe provide happiness. But what you talked about with value is something that provides purpose, right? When you tap into value, you tap, you start tapping into your purpose. What, yes. you know, what am I, 
what are my values? What am I valued for? That starts to then get into this place of like when you're living purposefully, yeah. you're living with, you know, money and happiness. I always kind of equate kind of similar to like pleasure. Like yes. It's short term, right? But where's the yes. purpose? And, th and that comes from like really truly understanding your value is kind of what I took from what you said. Yeah. And I remember what the Greeks call it. They call it hedonic happiness and eudaimonic happiness, which mm. is exactly what mm -hmm. you were thinking is like yeah. hedonism, pleasure. Yep. Eudaimony, which is like the purpose. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Anything that hasn't been said that you wanted to to say in this episode? No, I think we've covered pretty yeah. much everything. Yeah. yeah. This yeah. was fun. Yeah, this... it was a great time. Thank you yeah, very much for having me. Yeah, I really appreciate you coming on. It's fun as always. Yes. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Really enjoyed that. Okay. Well, thank you guys for watching and listening, and we'll see you guys in the next episode. For additional support or to work with one of us one-on-one, -on -one, go to our website, www.wellnessdojo.ca. You can also find us on Instagram, at wellnessdojoyyc, or on all other social media platforms searching The Wellness Dojo. We'll see you in the next episode.